إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا تأوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس تأوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يقع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dear brothers and sisters in Islam first just a thanks and extension of gratitude to our organizations here Muslim Student Organization and the Women of Islam it is of course a great pleasure and honor of mine to be visiting you once again and I actually remember the first event that I did when I came back to the United States from the University of Medina was right here uh, with you guys so um, it's good to be back here again and I, I do believe that it was in this exact same hall so that was the first time I was here and until now we were in various other locations around your campus but um, I do appreciate you inviting me to talk about uh, this topic, the topic of identity as a Muslim. And this, of course, is a very, I should say, delicate subject with many people, especially in our current environment, the climate that we're in as Muslims, whether it is here in the United States or anywhere else in the world, Muslims today are having a a, a challenge with their identity. And in all honesty, identity of a Muslim, what I'd like to do is for you to think about this in two ways. How you identify yourself and how others identify you. So the identity of a Muslim, it's really twofold. How you identify yourself and what you identify with, as well as others outside, your classmates, your professors, your neighbors, your relatives, your family, your friends, how they identify you. What is your identity as a Muslim with them? Identity for many people, and I would go to the extent of saying identity as a Muslim for most people today, it is found in their name. It is found in their name. Their name is Muhammad or Fatima or Aisha or, or Ahmed or whatever it may be, a Muslim name. This is the extent of many of our Muslim brother and sister's identity. That's who I am, that's what I was born with, I was given that name, so I'm Muslim. But the reality of that, or some people might think that their identity is a claim, beyond the name it's a claim, I'm Muslim. Some people, they might have a Muslim name, but they not, might not go to the, to the next step of saying I'm Muslim. They haven't, I've met some people before, the name Bilal. He was given the name Bilal by his parents, but over time, he adopted the name Bill, or his name was Muhammad, and at some point in his life he started telling people, listen, my name is Mo. And it goes on. And some people, they go from one name actually, and they go very far off, to another, totally another name. My name was Abdullah, but you can call me Steve. <laughs> so they lost the name, they lost the claim. But we have to understand that it's a lot more than that. It's not sufficient to just identify yourself as a Muslim by name or by claim. Yes, I'm a Muslim. You can add me to that CIA fact book statistic. And I've done my part for Islam. 
Instead of 1.9, and I was reading some of your materials in the, um, in the clubhouse, it says 1.9 billion Muslims in the world uh, since 2000, and the number it has increased, I'm sure. I have claimed, now I'm, we are, as an ummah, 1.9 billion and one. So I have, I have helped, I have done my part, no. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions, when you look at their identity, when you look at what they identified with, when you look at how they were identified with their, with their peers and their neighbors and even their enemies, you will find that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his identity was an identity of reformation. Reformation of belief and action. Reformation to bring about change, to bring about betterment in belief and in change. So there's actually a story that I was reminded of when I first heard the topic, which was suggested, identity of a Muslim. And some of you may be familiar with this story. Some of you might not be. And if you have heard the story before, then I want you to try to think about it in terms of how does it apply today and how is it significant? What are the similarities that we're facing, that we're going through, some of perhaps even our own negligence in the way that this story plays out? So as many of you know, the Prophet Sallallahu when he began inviting people to Islam, he did it secretly. He called his family members and his close friends in secret. As this was instructed by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, but eventually that developed into a public, open invitation. And this is when the Prophet والسلام, and the few followers that he had as companions began to feel the the difficulties of inviting others to Allah with you, the challenge, which I'm sure each and every one of you involved in da'wah or asking people to listen or invite them to Islam, you find these challenges and these difficulties. But this type of challenge they went through and it became almost impossible to bear for many of them, especially those that were weak, especially those that did not have a sponsor, a, a strong tribe. They were not originally from that region. They didn't have a large family. They didn't have support, so they found that they were taking the brunt of the punishment from these, these idolaters of Quraysh. So in the fourth year, four and a half or close to the fifth year, the punishment and the torment, the oppression of the Quraysh, the idolaters of the Quraysh, was now felt so hardly and extremely with the Muslims that the Prophet Sallallahu he sought to seek or send his companions, those that were very weak, out of that region because they were, they were under threat of actually losing their identity. And this is a very crucial point for us to understand. That these very weak Muslims, and I see this all the time in my position here as an imam, I see young Muslims, their parents come to my office and say, please help with my teenager or my college student or whatever. They they're, they're gone. I think I've lost them. I think they've left Islam. I think that they, they don't pray anymore. They don't want to come to the masjid. They do the end of it. Right? They're on drugs or they're, on, they're, they're drinking and they have boyfriends and girlfriends and all the nightmares that many of our parents have for us as, as young Muslim uh, uh, people. So I can see how someone can walk right out of Islam losing their identity, losing their their, their faith, losing their pride as a Muslim. So the Prophet Sallallahu saw that these Muslims that were very weak, some of them were shaking in their faith because they had to deal with not just stares or name calling like we might have to deal with, but they were dealing with being abused physically, being abused financially, being tortured and harmed. So that would push someone over the edge. It would push someone out of Islam. They say, I can't, I can't deal with this. I can't live like this. I can't handle this. And they would want to go back to comfort and ease. And we as human beings, the natural tendency is to do what's easy. Is to do the easy thing. And this was even the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Of course, in the realm of Islam, was, if he had a choice to make between two things, he would take the easiest of the things. And this is, this is Rahma for us as Muslims. To take the easiest of the things. So the easiest of those choices was to allow them to migrate to a safer area where they could practice their faith where they could develop their identity. And so he sent them to Abyssinia. He 
He sent them to Abyssinia, to a king, a Christian king. So this is a total different faith, a total different way of life and belief. And, 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 uh, and the very fundamentals of that belief in Abyssinia, it contradicted the fundamental belief of Islam. But because they would be given shelter and safety, they would be able to practice their religion freely. And in security, the Prophet ﷺ saw this to be a better choice for them. And so they went. They went and they made this migration. This was in the fifth year of the, of the call to Islam. So they went there and it began with just a few men and women. The number wasn't more than 20 or 22. And they, they were led by Uthman ibn Affan, one of the great companions of the Prophet وسلم, and his wife, who was the daughter of the Prophet And they stayed there for a short time. There was something interesting that happened. This is a side note in the seal of the Prophet وسلم, The Prophet was, uh, as he would from time to time, reciting the Quran. And the Quraysh that were against him, attacking him, they would, when they would hear the ayat, some of them would, would speak over him. And they would begin to, to use foul language to distract people away from the words of Allah. Because the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they carry great power and might. So when he was reciting these ayat, he reached an ayat that commanded the people to prostrate. And these people amongst the Muslims, they of course they prostrated, but even the non-Muslims, the Quraysh, the idolaters, they were so overwhelmed and overcome and defeated internally by these words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they also fell and prostrated. They prostrated. And this was a very monumental, a very impacting moment for the Muslims to see this. That your enemies have now submitted themselves, some of them unwillingly, unknowingly, they just prostrated. They heard this ad, it says it commands for you to prostrate, and they did. So this news had traveled back to Abyssinia, to that small group of migrants. They heard this and they thought, alhamdulillah, our problems are over the Quraysh, they become Muslim, they're making sujood. They're listening and obeying Allah as well. So they, they returned. They returned and that by this time, the Quraysh, they heard that the Muslims that had migrated to Abyssinia had found peace and serenity and, and safety, and this angered them, right? Because they were putting pressure on this community, trying to push them away from that faith, trying to weaken that identity as being a person of faith, a believer in Allah. And so, they increased in their torment and punishment. They increased, they made it worse, they made it harder to deal with. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent another group to a set for a second migration. And this time there were 83 men and 18 women. So this was a large group that was sent. A large group was sent to this king of Abyssinia. And when this happened, the Quraysh now, a small group was not a big deal, but a large group of people can become dangerous. A larger group means there's power, like power in numbers. So if they were to go off and find security and safety, they would be treated kindly. They would have time to grow spiritually, to develop Islamically, to get stronger in their faith. The person, the stronger they are, the harder it is for, to, for, for a person to shake them. The stronger and more knowledgeable that the person is in their faith, the harder it is for someone to come and shake that faith and to throw doubts into their heart. So this was something that was going to be uh, a threat to them. So they sent after them two of their strongest and most stern idolaters, Amr ibn As and Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah. This was before they accepted Islam. And so they went bearing gifts and treasures and jewels and, and riches. And they were sent to, to, to this king of Abyssinia and they were told to give him these jewels and these riches and these treasures and to tell him to let them return with their people, with their tribesmen. And they even said that there are some foolish people. They began to blame them. There are foolish people, ignorant people. There are troublemakers, they said. They have split our society and they have split our way of life. Right? They have made division in our society. They are, they are rebels and they are in your community and we've come offering you these gifts and hoping that you will allow us to take them back, to remove them. So here's a real problem, or what could be a problem. The Muslims that now found safety, 
that were essentially refugees and they found refuge with this Christian king. Now the Christian king is being given money and golds and, and basically being paid off to allow the Quraysh to take back the followers of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi forcefully if need be. But the Christian king, as was understood by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was a just man. And what he needed to do at this point to be just was to identify who these people were. He needed to identify what was going on, the two parties. He needed their identification. And this is where it comes down to what you identify with and how others identify with you. So he called the Muslims to come forward and he began to ask them some questions. He asked them about this faith. What is this, this deen, I should say, this way of life? They're claiming that you have divided them and that you have divided their way of life. So tell us about this way of life that you have come with, this new way of life, this new deen. Right, so one of the companions there, Jafar, he came to him, Nabi Talib, Rabbi Allah, he came to the king and he was their spokesman. And he was considered the most eloquent amongst the companions that were there in Abyssinia. So he began and he talked, and this was reported by Imam Ahmed in his collection of hadith on Ummi Salama, Rabbi Allah, which is a great companion, one of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam later on at the end of her life. She was the one that also, she also migrated to Abyssinia. So she was reporting and relating the story that happened with the king. So she said that Jafar, he went up to the king and he began to talk to him. And he said to him that we were a people in ignorance and darkness. Now you have to keep in mind, he's going to describe his society pre-Islam. And he's describing it with those people of the Quraysh present. So what he's going to say is subject to their rebuttal. They could say, oh, he's lying. He's not telling the truth. They could stop at any moment. And what I want you to do when you hear these qualities that he's describing, is I want you to think about the society that you're living in. Whether it's your society at home, whether it's at your home, in your house, or whether it's in, within yourself. These qualities, he says, we were a people in ignorance and darkness. We were worshiping asnam, idols. We were worshiping idols. Right? So when you think about our society where we live today, the majority of people, what are they worshiping? Are they worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or are they worshiping some type of ta'ud, some type of false god, some type of idol? You can just walk out onto the street here and you might even find some of these statues and figurines even somewhere on campus here. He says, وَنَأْكُلْمَيْتَ We would eat dead animals. We would eat dead flesh. Right, so here we're looking at the, the type of nutrition. This is a very big deal. The type of nutrition, the type of food that a person eats because it has an effect on the soul. We would eat dead animals, dead flesh. He says, وَنَأْتِ الْفَلَاحِشِ And we would also perform immoral acts. Illicit, lewd behavior. College campus. Right? College campuses is filled with thalash. Depending on the campus, of course. Medina University was a little bit more reserved and conservative than, than some other. NC State is where I went before I went there. In North Carolina. State College. You have a city college. The Wolfpack, yeah. We'll pack until, until death, inshallah. <laughs> All right, so if you, if you stay on campus for more than a couple of minutes, you'll see some falahish, probably. You'll see some evil, some illicit acts, some lewdness, some crudeness, right? Some immorality of sorts. This is what they were doing. And it was, it was considered normal. It was not shameful. Today, that's, that's, that's the protocol. That's the procedure today. That's encouraged behavior today. And I'm sure that you've heard this or you have a friend that has, has maybe even said this, I don't know how exposed you are, but everywhere we're all the same here. You have to try it out before you commit. Right, dating. And even moving in together, pretending to be married together, having a life together without actually being responsible and committed. You should try it out. You should try a few. You should date a little bit. Learn a bit 
See who it is that you like, what you don't like. Taste it, test it to the end of it. Right? He goes on and he says, and we used to, we used to uh, cut our family ties. We used to cut our family ties with our, 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 our close relatives, our mothers and our fathers and our uncles and aunties and to the end of it. We would cut the family ties. Today in the United States, a child can go to court and divorce the parents. Can divorce the parents. And, and this actually, this, this, this particular problem here is not just reserved for non-Muslim, non-faithful people, non-conservative people, but it's also happening in our Muslim households. Especially at this age, college age, when you're ready to get married. And I'll give you the scenario. Because I've seen it many times. And it's, it's unfortunate, it's a very difficult situation. The imam of the masjid sometimes has to be an arbitrator between the kids and the parents. So the child, I shouldn't say the child, but the young Muslim adult who is in college or in high school has caught the eye of someone else. And they want to get married. They're very excited. They're very ready. And they go home to mom and dad. They say, oh, mom and dad, I've fallen in love with someone. I'm ready to get married. Okay? And they say, uh, depending on the parents, they say, well, where are they from? And you say, they're from the country that you don't like. <laughs> right? If you're Pakistani, you say, he's Bengali. They say, oh. Right? If you're Arab, and you say any other country than that Arab country, they say, oh. And then the extended relatives start calling, what do you think, if you even consider it, what are you doing? What are you thinking? This is wrong. This is a shame. This is shame on us. How can you do this? Don't you know those people? They're this, they're that. They're this, they're that. Regardless of the, the, the one, the boy or the girl, the man or the, the woman, regardless of how they are, their character, their family, their religious practice and observance, they could be the best. They could be a shining star in the community. But there's a problem. Or it could be not. Or it could be not. Right? The person's fallen in love and has been on dates and has fallen in love with somebody and they go home and they want to get married and the parents say, no, this isn't a good person. This isn't a good match. So what happens? Sometimes the kid, I should say the young man or woman, they, they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they, and they listen to their parents because they know that there's no one else out there that is, that is worth destroying a relationship with a mother and a father. There's no one that's worth destroying the relationship you have with your family. Regardless of how cute they are, or how well they recite Quran, or whatever it is, how well they organize uh, events, or their action in the MSA, or their position, or whatever it may be, regardless of how well they are, there's nothing that can come between you and your parents. But sometimes we get lost in the moment, and so we begin to fight and argue with our parents. He goes on and he says, that we used to be evil to our neighbors. We used to be evil with our neighbors. This is the norm, not evil. Let's just say neutral, not good. We don't know the neighbor. How many people have lived in the same place for a number of years and you don't know the neighbor? You see them coming and going, in and out. They might live right next door. You hear the door opening. You hear the television next door. You hear the fighting next door. You hear the party next door. And it's going on for years and years and you don't know the neighbor's name. Oh, they're just quit talking. Uh, we don't need to know them. Or, oh, they're from that country that my parents don't like, so we don't need to know the name. We're not bothered with them. You get angry if they park in your spot, or you get worried when the trash is out too long in front of the hallway, or whatever it may be. So this type of thing happens. He went on, he says that we, we were a, a people that would take advantage of the weak. The powerful would, would prey on the weak and take advantage of them. If they had money and authority, they would get away with everything and they would persecute those that didn't. The have-nots were always at the end of the line. We can, re we can relate with that. So he goes on and he says, we were like this. He says, we were like this until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us a messenger. A messenger from ourselves. He says, we knew his lineage. We knew his honesty. We knew his, his trustworthiness and we knew his purity, qualities of leadership, qualities of leadership. And he says to this king, he just described, he just described these two men that came to get him. They didn't, they didn't 
have anything to say. There was no rebuttal reporting. They didn't stop them. No, this is not true. This is a lie. This is false. No. And this was the nature of those people at the time. That if it was a tribunal like this, then they knew that they had to be honest. They couldn't lie their way out of it. They were honest. So then he went on and he says that the Prophet wasallam, he called us and invited us to change, to reform, to change our identity. He wanted us to change our identity and to change the way that we were identified. And the first thing that we had to change was our belief. He says the Prophet wasallam, called us to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. To worship Him alone and to leave off and abandon all of the things that we, wish we used to worship, our fathers used to worship, and everything else like stones and statues and figurines. This was the first change, the first point of identity. And if you were to put it on a card, like you have your driver's license or your passport, the first thing up there, that's number one. Above the name. Above the name Ahmed or above the name Abdullah, the first thing is, I worship Allah alone without partner. There is nothing that I associate in His worship. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Rabb, the Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the sustainer and the provider who has given everything that we have and that can take everything that He has given in a moment that has given us life and that will bring about our death whenever He wills, however He wills, in whatever way that He wills, subhanahu. This is number one. And this was a big thing. This was a big thing from, from leaving or from worshiping multiple gods and idols and figurines and statues to leaving all of that to worshiping something that is unseen. To worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is unseen before they could see and identify. Here, some of them were worshiping objects like this. And, they would, and, and people still do this today from what I hear, stories. They have their little statue at home and in the morning they wake them up and they give them food and they give them a bath and they put them in their house and then at night they come back and they find the food is still there. It wasn't eaten, but now it's special food. And then they take him and they lay him down and they let him go to sleep or they give him dinner or whatever. And they pray to these objects. They can see it. It's real. It's tangible. Human beings, we love tangible things. And that's what a lot of people here today are moving towards. A belief in only what is tangible, what we can measure, what is real, that we can hold. You understand where I'm going with this? And if you're not careful, this, this belief, it will spin your brain right around. And there have been many people that have fallen victim to this. Can't see it, can't measure it, it's not real. I believe in science, my faith is science. My faith is in science. This is what people sometimes claim. And here they were doing, not quite scientific, but it's still um, earth science, right? Wood and stone, wooden statues and stones, and some of them worshiping dates and, and, and fire. This is all earth science stuff. At least that's what I remember from earth science class. You remember anything from earth science class? Nah. Okay. Well, now you guys are, that was a re refresher for you. And just get brushed up on that. So he went on talking to this king. So this was number one. He goes on and he says, and of course this call was the call of all the prophets and messengers, to call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was the first order. Well, if you open the Quran, and if you get to read from the first chapter onward, you'll find that the first command in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, it is to worship Allah alone. To worship Allah alone and without pardon. The next thing he says and to fulfill trusts. To fulfill a trust. This is extremely important. This is going to begin a reformation not only of belief and theology of creed, but it's going to begin a reformation of society and how things work. This is going to shape the foundations of a society that is not built upon these things. Where people don't fulfill their trusts. Where people betray their trust, where they lie, where they cheat, where they steal. And this is one of the things that shook the foundations of the Quraysh. The Prophet was commanding them that they had to fulfill their trust. A man, 
The Prophet ﷺ, he was called Al-Amin, the trustworthy. Even before Islam, they called him Al-Amin. Because he was known even before this great revelation of Allah that his character, his identity, it was trustworthy. He was identified as a trustworthy person. And they were happy when they saw him and when he was entrusted with their affair, they were satisfied. They were happy. And that's the story when they rebuilt the Kaaba. The Kaaba was destroyed in a flood and the Quraysh, they got together and they wanted to rebuild it. They ended up in a quarrel as to who was going to place the last stone to have the honor, shelf, wanted to be honorable and the, the dignity and the nobility of completing that construction project. And they said that the quarrel developed and developed until they were at a stalemate and on the brink of war and it lasted for a couple of days, arguing back and forth. Until finally the one that was the, the head of the construction project, he says, whoever comes in the door next will be the one to figure out what we're going to do. The Prophet والسلام, he walked in the door. He walked in the door and all of them, four tribes, they were satisfied. They said, Had al Muhammad, Had al This is Muhammad, this is the trustworthy. This is Muhammad, this is the trustworthy. They said later, it was reported that they said, if it wasn't anyone else other than him, we would have been satisfied. The argument would have continued. But the Prophet ﷺ, because of his, his identity as being trustworthy, brothers and sisters, look at the Muslim's identity in this category today. Are we, first, do we identify this quality of being trustworthy? Do we identify with this as something important? Or is this something secondary? If it, if it suits my needs, I'll be trustworthy. If not, then I have to do a little, little shady activity. If I need to get around, if I need to move about. New York, it's the city of sharks, right? Everyone's doing little moves here and there. Questionable things here and there. That's the reality. I lived here for a year. I got to know a little bit about what happens. And that is not just outside of our communities as Muslims. In fact, sometimes, some people identify the Muslims as being the most untrustworthy people around. How has this happened? How have we reached this level? How have we sunk to this level? That we've lost this, this identity of being trustworthy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَن تُعَدُّ الْأَمَنَاتِ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهَا Allah says in the Quran, He says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders you to fulfill your trust to those who have entrusted you, or are entrusted. You have been entrusted. So you have been fulfilled. Yet murukum, it's an order, it's an obligation. It's a wajib, a fal. That means if you don't do it, it's sinful. It's oppressive, right? A lot, of, a lot of things are going on in the media today, in the news around the world about oppression. And a lot of people have stood up against oppression and are behind trying to to right wrongs and trying to correct these oppressive acts, making dua of Allah. Save us, help us, bring us security, bring us justice. But as a person of faith, we have to identify ourselves as owning, possessing this quality of, of trustworthiness. Look at this, trustworthiness. In general, it's understood. If somebody entrusts you with something, you can be trusted with it. They give you a secret, you can hold it. They give you a secret, you can keep it. They give you something, you'll take care of it. They say, listen, here's my car for the weekend. I, I, I have to go out of town. Please watch over it. Please, you know, there's alternate side parking coming up. Please watch it and move it for me. I, I can trust you. That you're not going to take the car and go downtown, go to Halal Guys, go to... Uh, there used to be this really nice bakery we would go to downtown. They sell cupcakes and, you know what I'm talking about? Anyone? It's close to Halal, guys, you can walk there. Very, very popular, it's always full. You're not gonna go cruise down there, get you some cupcakes, hang out with the car, little dent in it here and there from the parking and then bring it back. Oh, yeah, that was good. I just moved it here and there back and forth. Let it get a ticket. We understand that meaning of, of trust, but there's another meaning here, a more, a more profound meaning, and this was reported by Ibn Kathir, a great scholar of tafsir, of the past. He says that here the amanat, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about al amanat, he says there are two types. There are two types. 
The amana, he says, it is to fulfill the rights of someone, to give them their complete rights. He says the first one, it is hukukullah, the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted us with certain things. He has obligated upon us certain things. He has made obligatory and compulsory upon us certain things, which are his rights for us to fulfill. And that begins with our five daily prayers. Right? That begins with our, our modesty. That begins with our character, our behavior, our relationship with our parents. These, this is an amana. The life that he has given us, it is an amana. The time that he has given us, it is an amana. And if we abuse it and misuse it, we will not be fulfilling that amana. The right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's no one greater and more important for us to fulfill the right of than him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Azza wa Jalla. This is first and foremost in the amana. How many Muslims today aren't fulfilling these obligations? The very basic ones. Five daily prayers. Five daily prayers. Forget about in the masjid. Just on the road, along the way, at home, in school, wherever it may be. This thing, one of the most important things, the most important obligation to fulfill. Have we, have we been trustworthy with this amana? The right of Allah Azza wa Next he goes on and he says that the second type is the rights of the creation. And this is when we get back to dealing with one another and how we, how we interact with one another. Are we trustworthy or are we not? He goes on to the next, the next quality. This is when he's talking to the king, Najash. He says, to join the family ties. To join the family ties. To be kind. This is what I was hinting at earlier. There's a story that, very interesting, very profound story. This happened from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. He said that one night, my mother, she asked me for a drink of water. My mother asked me for a drink of water. Now I want you to think for a moment, myself. Think of me. Think of how this would play out in your house. And be honest with yourself. You don't have to share anything. Your mother says, can I have a drink of water? And you're busy with schoolwork, or you're chatting on the phone, or you're on your Facebook account, and you're texting back and forth, or you're playing a video game, you're watching a sports uh, program on TV, and you're engrossed in whatever it is that you're doing, and you're busy. Your mother says, Beta G, I need some water. And she's just sitting there, right? She could go 15 feet to the refrigerator, get that nice cup, and fill it up with water from the the, the, the refrigerator or the tap, but she's asking you, what are you going to do? And the Lord Masood, he said, okay, of course. The difference here is that the water wasn't at home. It's not in the refrigerator or the tap. He has to go to the well. The water is not in the house now. It's gone for the day. He has to go out to the well. So he has to get dressed and he has to go out of the house. He has to go to the well. He has to drop the bucket. He has to bring it back up. And then he has to go back to the house and then give his mother a sip, a drink of water. When he came back, he said, I found that my mother fell asleep. Khalas, right? She's asleep. I can go back to my video game or my whatever, whatever, whatever. He said, but I was afraid that if I left her, she would wake up thirsty. But I didn't want to disturb her sleep, so I didn't wake her up to say, hey, mother, you have, here's the water. And she might say, oh, you were late, you took too long, I fell asleep, I'm tired, I don't need water. He said, so I stood there. I stood there quietly, I stood there patiently to give my mother a drink of water. And I waited for her to wake up, and I was standing there with the water, and I gave it to her. Just for a moment. How would that play out in your house? Your mother says, take the trash out. Something, clean your room or do the dishes or prepare the food. How would that play out? What would happen? What would be your reaction? Do you identify with this as being important? Is this your identity that you join the family ties to this extent, to this level, that you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased with you? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, that the pleasure of Allah is found in the pleasure of the parents. He says, The pleasure of your Lord is found in the pleasure of your parents. And he went says that the anger of your Lord is found in the anger of your parents. So when your parents are pleased with you, Allah is pleased with you.
disagrees with you, when your parents are angry with you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angry with you. Do you identify with this? Is this how you identify yourself? Is this how your parents identify you? Your identity is on, is on the line here. When your parents look at you, do they say, this is a pious, righteous, obedient child of mine? Or do they say, this child has done nothing but bring me sadness, sorrow, and headache? They don't listen, they talk back, they're disrespectful. To the end, the list goes on. The companions of the Prophet Sallallahu the Prophet Sallallahu of course, he was an orphan. He did not have the opportunity to treat his parents in this manner. But he did with his uncle Abu Talib. His uncle Abu Talib, who was not a Muslim. His uncle Abu Talib had a large family, had many children. Amongst them was Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu. They said in, 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 in Abu Talib's career, there was a very low point. Financial disaster hit. And so it became very difficult for him to, to take care of his large family with all of his children. Now the Prophet وسلم, essentially grew up in the house of Abu Talib. After his mother passed away and he was living with his, his grandfather for only two or three years, Abu Talib, his uncle, took him into his house when he was around eight years old. And he lived there until he was grown into his adult and as a man. And so when this happened to his uncle Abu Talib, that he lost his money, lost his everything, his fortune, his wealth, and he was having a hard time feeding his own children, the Prophet وسلم, went to his uncle and says, I will adopt one of your children. I will adopt the responsibility, not like here, adoption, but I will adopt the responsibility of one of your children. He grew up, Abu Talib adopting the responsibility of his parents, taking care of him. So he went to re repay the favor. He went to pay him back. And he took Ali ibn Abi Talib into his house. And he took care of Ali ibn Abi Talib until he grew up, relieving the burden of his own. This was the manner of the Prophet وسلم, with, with, his, with his own family. This is, what, this is what they identified him with, this quality. The first moments of revelation. The Prophet وسلم, first received revelation and he went back to his house, the house of his wife Khadija anha, and he was shaken. He was worried, he was, he was afraid. He was anxious about what was happening. I mean, you can imagine something so strange and powerful happening, revelation, being visited by an angel. A person would be shocked, a person would be scared. He went to his wife, and his wife began to comfort him, to console him, and to encourage him. And the first thing that she said to him, she says, Inna rahim. says, you join the family ties. You keep the family together. That was the first quality that she praised him with to build up his confidence and his, and his foothold in receiving this revelation, that you join the family ties. So you can see amongst his companions, his great companions, this was their, this was their identity, that they would be identified as obedient, righteous children that join the family ties, not split them up, that didn't act as agents of evil in their own family, and we can find this. Sometimes feuds go on in the family, back and forth, back and forth. They go on for years and years and years, and sometimes we don't even know why or how or when it started. We don't like that cousin, we don't like that auntie, they're this, they're that, they're the other. Right? This one's hijab is too tight, this one's skin is too dark, this one's whatever, whatever. You don't even know what you're saying anymore. This happens in our households. Where is our identity? Where is our identity? This is real. This is real identity. At least that's what we can see from these types of, of actions and behavior, the character of these great companions. When they were described, this is what they were described with. <clears throat> there are many other great stories. This is a topic all in itself. And there's actually something, just to conclude this topic, one of the great, Ibn Abbas, one of the great companions of the Prophet وسلم, talking about some of the ayah, he was considered to be one of the greatest scholars of tafsir amongst the Sahaba. He understood the Quran. He understood its revelation. He understood its meaning when it was revealed, why it was revealed. All right, so he was talking about three verses. He says there are three verses in the Quran that they are connected with each other. That there, within the verse, there are things that are attached to each other. There are three ayah that are attached to three things. So he went and he said the first ayah 
He says, Ati Allah wa Ati Rasul. Obey Allah and obey his messenger. So in this ayah, he's saying that the first part, obey Allah, is attached to the second part and obey the messenger. He says that if one of these is missing, if the attached part is missing, then the first part doesn't have any weight. It doesn't count. So if a person is trying to be in the obedience of Allah, but they're not in the obedience of the messenger, then their trying to be in obedience of Allah will not count. It will not have any value, any merit. And that's where we get the concept of bid'ah, innovation in Islam, to bring about new ways of worship. And you have to be in conformity with the Prophet Sallallahu for your obedience to Allah to count and to measure up. The next thing he says was, Perform the prayer and give the charity. These are attached, the zakat with the salah. Right, so if a person prays their five daily prayers, but they're sitting on their money and not giving that zakat, which is a haq, illah, it's a right of Allah, they're not giving their zakat, then essentially the prayers, they're gone. And this is where we get the battle of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Rabbi Allah anhu, when he went out to fight against those that prevented the payment of zakat, saying it was not an obligation. And then finally he gets to the last one, he says, and give thanks to me, Allah, and give thanks to your parents. He says these two are attached. These two are attached. Without the second attachment, the first doesn't have any merit. We thank Allah. We praise Allah. We glorify Allah. We pray to Allah. We work for Allah. We do da'wah for Allah. We wear hijab for Allah. We grow our beard for Allah. To the end of what we do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of gratitude and thanks, out of praise, glorification. But if the treatment of our parents is not one of gratitude as well, thanking them, then all of that effort, it will be spoiled by the treatment, the ill treatment of our parents. This is our identity. This is how not only we identify ourselves, whether we think it or not, whether we choose or not, we're doing it, and others are identifying it, and this is ultimately how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will identify us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will identify us in this manner. <clears throat> the neighbor is another thing that he mentioned. Ja'far al-Nabi Talib radiallahu anhu, he says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi has ordered us to be kind to our neighbors, to be good to our neighbors. This was not something that was commonplace during that time as it is not commonplace today. They were noted, of course, the, the Arab for their, their, their hospitality and their generosity. Some of them exceeded, some of them exceeded beyond others in this particular quality. But there were also times in which they were evil to their neighbor. So, when we look at the neighbor, this was something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of course, was very serious about in regards to cultivating the identity of his ummah. The ummah's identity. And this is the reality. Right? If you're not too concerned about yourself or how you look, or I'm nobody, no one's looking at me, no one's watching me. People are watching the ummah. People are looking at the ummah and identifying us with certain qualities and traits and characteristics. The Muslim ummah is this one, two, three. They're identifying us, right, the neighbor. And I'll give you my experience. Traditional American neighbor, right? When the neighbor, when you're out outside in the house, maybe you do this too, and you see the neighbor coming up, you go inside quickly. Come on, quick, let's go inside before we have to say hello or we have to talk to them. Hurry up, let's go inside. Get the stuff, bring the stuff inside. Don't let them see what we have, quickly. And then if the neighbor does come over, they come in, and this is more of an American thing probably than anything else. The neighbor comes to the door, and you're almost irritated. Like, ah, he's watching a show. The game's on, now the neighbor's here, what do you need? Come in, have a seat. And he sits there. You don't offer anything, you don't give anything, you don't show any hospitality, you're just waiting. You're looking like at the clock, when's the neighbor gonna go? This is not Husnul Jawad, being a good neighbor. 
The Prophet ﷺ actually ordered his companions, he says, if you wake up in the morning and you're making marak, if you know what that is, that's when you're cooking meat in like soup in the water. This is a traditional dish during that time and it's continued on to today. He says, if you're making marak, if you go to a Yemeni cafe in Brooklyn, you ask for marak, they'll bring you a bowl of marak. You can test that out. It's nice. So you put the meat in there, and of course the meat's the prize, right? But the meat, as it's cooking throughout the day, it's, it's also giving flavor to the water. He says, increase the amount of water in your marak so that you can give it to your neighbor. Then you can give your neighbor, you can feed from your own food. He also prevented his companions and followers, us, from, from preventing our neighbors from the usage of our home. How is that? During that time, they're building the houses. There was no property line or anything like that, like strict. He said, don't prevent your neighbor from using your wall as their wall, to put up their house and construct it on the side of your house. Don't prevent the neighbor from this. Right, today people go to court. People go to court today. He built a fence over my property line by an inch. They go to court. His tree is hanging over my yard and it's dropping leaves into my yard. When he puts his trash out, he puts it too close to my mailbox, preventing the neighbor from being neighborly. This is a terrible, terrible way to be identified. He went on and he says, He says, and he prevented us from the prohibitions, and he prevented us from spilling blood, from, from bloodshed, from taking a life wrongfully, right? From, from killing someone who is innocent, taking the law into your own hand. It's not permitted in Islam. To take the law into your own hand is not permitted in Islam. Islam has a legal system, has a legal code. And that legal code and that legal system it is reserved for those that are in charge and in the position to enforce that legal code. It is not for us to try and enforce that. And even if it was done rightfully, justly, it's not in our hands. But even more so if it was unjust, murder, attack, abuse. The Prophet of Allah has suddenly prohibited his companions from that. Next he says, he prohibited us from al-fawahish, which we were talking about earlier. Al-fawahish wa qawl al-zur. From lewdness and, 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 and poor behavior, illicit behavior. And from false speech, from lying and, and saying things that are not true. The Prophet Sallallahu went to the extent in this regard that he said that I have been entrusted with a house in the middle of paradise. He says, أَنَا زَعِيمٌ بِبَيْتٍ فِي وَسَطِ الْجَنَّةِ لِمَنْ تَرَكَ الْكَذِبَ وَإِنْ كَانَ مَازِحًا He says, I've been given a house in the middle of paradise to give to the one that stops lying even when they're joking. Even when they're joking. This is so easy to lie when you're trying to bring people to laughter. To embellish the story, to make up a new story, to lie about a story, to get people to, to bring joy, to bring happiness, to bring a smile. But to stop the habit from forming and developing into something worse than that, the Prophet ﷺ encouraged his companions and his followers to be truthful regardless of the situation, regardless of what was at stake. And then he says in the last part of this, he says, prohibited us from, from stealing from the, from the orphan and from wrongly accusing the pious, chaste women of being unchaste. This is a way of attack, character assassination to wrongfully assassinate someone's character. And this was considered by the Prophet ﷺ from the greatest, deadliest of sins. These two things, to eat or to consume the wealth of an orphan, someone who cannot fend for themselves or defend their rights. The Prophet ﷺ was an orphan, and at a young age he could not fend for himself. He could not take care of himself. But he had to have someone that he would be entrusted to, as well as those pious and chaste women to avoid casting any doubt into the community about them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, is from the seven major deadly sins, these types of, this type of behavior. So this great companion, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, he concluded with this. This was how he identified his companions, his friends. 
his fellow migrants. When, when the king of Abyssinia asked them, what is this way of life? Who are you people? What is it that you're doing? How is it that you split your community? He identified himself and the followers and his faith with these qualities. These are the main qualities of Islam. Qualities that are restricted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worship, servitude, obedience to Allah. And then qualities that are communal. To live in peace, security, and honesty, and justice. This was the identity. This was the identification card that he gave. So this is what we are. This is who we are. And those two from the Quraysh that were standing there witnessing these words, they could not say otherwise. They could not refute what they said. Because the Muslims at that time, even though they were few and weak, even though they had to leave and were refugees, they lived their faith. They lived it every moment. They identified with it 24 hours a day. Every waking moment, this is what they identified with. This is what they lived for. This is how they wanted to be seen. This is how they wanted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see them and identify them. And they were people of obedience to Allah. They fulfilled these obligations. They fulfilled their rights. And so, the Quraysh that were there, they couldn't say anything and they were defeated. And the Christian king said, I won't give them up for all of the gold in the world. And he returned their, he returned their jewels and their money and all that. He wasn't bought off. He said, I won't give them up for anything. And the only thing that was left for these Quraysh to do, and they came back the next day and tried to attack, attack the creed of Islam regarding the Muslims' belief of Isa the money of Islam. So he said that, Jahan Ali Talib, he says, because of these things that I mentioned to you, our identity, we're being attacked. We're being persecuted. We're being run off. We've had to flee our, our home, our, our, our land, our family. But for them, it was worth it. For them, their identity was more important than their comfort, than the ease of living. Their identity was more important than just getting on and being unnoticed. Their identity was more important than feeling satisfied and happy, having luxury, not being the standout in the crowd. They weren't worried about that. They weren't worried, oh, I'm going to be embarrassed, or I'm going to be too shy, or I can't do this, or I can't do that. I can't pray in front of some, I can't pray in front of people. I can't pray in front of somebody, I'm embarrassed. You should be embarrassed in front of Allah. Is that how you identify yourself as someone that's cowardly? These, these men and women, they were brave. They were brave. This was their identity, they were brave. They stood in front of, uh, they stood in front of these enemies of Islam. And they were ready to take whatever came. So, I don't want to take too much of the time because I know we're getting close to prayer. But there are a couple tools that I'll leave you with. Some practical tools that you can do as an organization or as a group of friends or whatever to help develop a strong Muslim identity in all its facets to develop this identity. The first and foremost is sincerity to Allah. Is to be sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To have ikhlas. That you are sincere in what you're doing to gain His pleasure. And the sincerity also is that when you are Inviting people to Islam, calling people to Islam, that you're calling them sincerely to Allah alone. That you're sincere to Allah, and your invitation to Islam is sincere for Allah. Not for a group, not for a party, not for a person, not for a wali or a mola or whatever it may be, but to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. That's the first. The second thing, perhaps the most profound and important tool after sincerity, is knowledge. Is to learn. Many of us sitting here today, we don't know who we are. We don't know our, our history as Muslims. We don't know our heritage as Muslims, let alone the issues of our faith and our creed. But this knowledge of Islam, it is that which will strengthen your faith. Without knowledge, you're like a tree blowing in the wind. When the wind comes west, you blow with it. When the wind comes east, you blow with it. And you might identify with this. One person said this, so I did that. The other person said opposite, so I did that. Because you didn't know. You weren't aware. You weren't aware of what it was. We have to have knowledge of Islam, number one, so that we can know how to worship Allah. But number two, and this is important, 
so that we're not stripped of our identity by someone from outside. And I'm not talking about being attacked physically and made to give up your faith, but I'm talking about the way that you perceive things. Our perception, it is something that right now, and I honestly believe right now, this generation, we need to question everything that we perceive, how we perceive it. Is our perception in line with the Islamic tradition? Or is our perception of things, has it been fed to us from outside? The way that we view the world, the way that we view politics, the way that we view interpersonal relations, the way that we view how we should carry ourselves or behave, the way that we view what's in and what's out. Are those perceptions, have they been molded by the mold of Islam? Or have they been, have they, have they been given to us without us knowing? This is very crucial. This is one of the ways that the Muslim Ummah originally began to weaken, right? As the Muslims were, and I'll just give you this as a tidbit, as the Muslim Ummah was on the rise in the history of Islam, and it seemed as if they were undefeatable. Because there was a point where Islam was just developing and taking over and spreading across the globe, not just physically, but in all facets of life and development and exploration and knowledge and everything. And the outside world was looking at the Muslims going, what is it that these Muslims have that has accelerated their development? They used to be just some out of tribe, like satisfied with just killing each other and making a few gold coins here and there. They didn't develop. They were thousands of years just right there in their little dusty town. And now they've taken over and they've taken over the world. So they started to look and study. What is it that's given them this push? It's like they have fire underneath them. It's like there's fire underneath them and they're moving. What do you think it is that they identify? Against them? Islam. Allah, Islam. Allah, Islam. Islam. Okay, but there's something. Something specific, of course. Quran and Sunnah? The Quran. It was the Quran. They saw that they had this book. This was the thing that came. Of course, when you say the Quran, the Sunnah goes with it. They have to go together. They saw that before this book came, the outside world, Rome and Persia, they were not worried about these Arabs. They were not worried about them. They're not worried about one day that they would be at their doorstep and they were getting ready to mold them down. They weren't worried about them. They were with each other back and forth. Rome and Persia, the world powers. But they saw when this Quran was given to them, psh, victory was behind it. So what did they say? They said, the only way that we can slow their progress and defeat them is to put a wall between them and the Quran. A barrier between them and the Quran. So, we'll begin to attack their language. We'll begin to attack their ideas. Their mindset. Their understanding of the Quran. We'll begin to attack at it and chip away at it. Until eventually, now listen to this. Until eventually, all the Quran is, is a beautiful recitation. And a decoration in the home. When it's sitting on that little seat, you know that little X seat? It's just sitting there on the top shelf, mashallah, tabarakallah. Dusty, Ramadan comes, dust it off, and then we just enjoy the melody of the Imam. And I, and I know because I hear the complaints of my community. I say, just bring one body that his voice is mashallah. We'll be happy if you just bring one body, mashallah. And there's nothing wrong with having a beautiful voice. And this is from the Sunnah to beautify your voice. But the point of it, the Quran, is not to just, just to sit back and enjoy the melodious tones of a well-trained, well-versed and mature reciter, but it's to ponder and reflect over the meanings in those ayats. And then it is to act upon those meanings. And when this was removed, when this hijab was put between the Muslims and the Quran, then the Ummah began to topple. And you can see throughout history they began to drift further and further away from Islam. Their identity right here, their identification card became, my name is Muhammad, I'm Muslim. That's it. Can you read the Quran? No. Can you understand the Quran? No. So this is number one knowledge. And then following that, of course, is action, acting upon it, righteous deeds. Because the actions, the deeds, the worship that you do, it is a safeguard for you. 
It is a safeguard for your identity, your modesty, your chastity, your honor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, it means that the prayer, it prevents lewdness and evil. It prevents these things from happening. A person that is continuous with their prayer. And the prayer sometimes, brothers and sisters in the Quran, it is, it is not only meaning the prayer, but it also means worship in general. The prayer, a person that is continuous with their worship, devoted to their worship, they will save themselves from having their identity being put in question. So I'll conclude with that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the deen of Muhammad wa ahli da'wana. Alhamdulillah. 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 Alhamdulillah.